am I on? Or uh, good morning, everybody. Hi. Oh, it's nice to see a full room. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this discussion, which will be moderated by Dr. Tiffany Ana Lopez, who is the director of theater at the Herberger Institute of the Arts in uh, Arizona State University. She's also dramaturged. Uh, uh, here at OSF. She's done new work, world premieres, and Shakespeare as well. So we're really grateful that she's going to be leading our, our chat today. My name is Christopher Sebo, and I've had the great pleasure, thank you. Thank you. I've had the great pleasure to serve this organization for 12 seasons as the Associate Artistic Director, and since 2013 as the producer of the Latino Play, Play Project. Um, I have some notes here, let's see. Um, these writers on stage this morning in part represent the extraordinary breadth of the American canon. And in that breadth and scope grapple in their work to reconcile a shifting promise of our America and what it means to be equal and just in our country and the consequences of what happens when that declaration is empty or broken. OSF audiences no, Karen Zacharias from the wildly successful Destiny of Desire. Yes. <laughs> and next season, we'll encounter her newest play uh, and the 12th premiere of American Revolutions, The Copper Children. <laughs> next to Karen is Richard Montoya. Yes, <laughs> who along with the epic and pioneering uh, Clashers, Culture Clash, uh, a group he co-founded, Richard has the distinction of being the first writer produced by American Revolutions, American Night, the Ballad of Juan Jose. Mildred Ruiz Sapp as, yes. <laughs> Yes, they know you. Yes. <laughs> uh, as part of the uh, extraordinary universes, um, who were the first ensemble in residence at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, uh, has written two world premiere plays for OSF, including Party People and Unison. <laughs> and along with Octavio Solis, are residents of the Rogue Valley. Um, Octavio Solis, whose current world premiere opus, Mother Road, is currently playing on stage, has the distinction of being the only writer, with the exception of William Shakespeare, to have been produced in all four theaters at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Yes. And finally, Luis Alfaro, my traveling partner on this artistic highway, uh, including um, a slight merge into the Latino Play Project, um, is, among many things, uh, rec recognized by the Mar MacArthur Foundation as a genius. Um, also, <laughs> also, yes, Genio, also is the first writer in residence uh, at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And plays have been produced here, including Breakfast, Lunch, and Dinner, which was the first season that I was here as an associate artistic director, and um, Mojada, uh, another extraordinary work. So, oh my God, what a privilege it is to call you my friends and to welcome you here to OSF, and um, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, let's talk. All right. Chris. Thank you so much, Christopher. That was an amazing and powerful introduction. Uh, I want to thank everyone uh, for being here so early on a Sunday. And uh, just to say, here we are, creating a sense of a home space uh, by gathering together. Uh, home, I think, is a really, it's a term we often take for granted that we understand 
what it means. Uh, I think about in my own life, I left home at 15, and I very rarely finish the other part of that sentence, which is where I found my sense of home. My sense of home is often very complicated. Uh, in our conversations yesterday in the room with the Latinx Play Project group of folks gathered today together, uh, we had such a powerful range of conversation in which it was a space that we discussed how complicated our histories can be. And uh, the sense of home came up, uh, the sense of community came up, that we don't have a unified sense of what that means, uh, even though it is definitely something that pulses in uh, throughout as a thread throughout all of the work that we make. Um, Latinos have had a complex relationship to home because of uh, our different histories, and I would say that's not just a, a history to nationally, what it means to find a sense of home in different communities and nation spaces, but I think just our own personal histories of survival, um, what we found within our families of origin, but also what we find in our families of choosing, and then as artists, where do we go where we really feel a sense of home? Do we, ha do we step into homes that have already been made? Do we remodel homes? Do we rebuild homes? Do we imagine it uh, anew? All of the artists on the panel t here today, uh, home is a central theme in their work, but they also have been founders of different organizations and initiatives and projects in which they've built a sense of home for others to step into. So our, our conversation that we're gonna uh, launch in is really to start with thinking about in a very personal way, uh, what role does home play in your art? So I wanna open that as the question and we'll just hear from each of the artists about the role home plays in their work. So Karen, why don't you begin? Um, the sense of home, I think, is something that's been really important to me to create uh, family and trust everywhere I go because in some ways I, I don't know where I always belong. Um, and so trying to create that. Uh, my great-grandmother was born in Uruguay and she was taken to Lebanon to marry a much older man. She was 13. She got married in Lebanon to a Lebanese man who uh, supposedly for religious reasons. And the Ottomans were coming in, and so they moved to the Americas, which for them was Mexico, because she already spoke Spanish. Um, and they moved to Mexico, where they had my grandfather, and he was scandalous by marrying a Mexican mestizo woman. Um, and then they had my dad, who then was interested in socialized medicine, went to Denmark and married a Danish woman. <laughs> um, and then moved back to Mexico, where we grew up, um, you know, being Mexicans. And then the government started not liking his ideas, and then we moved to the United States. So the idea of where um, people belong is, is a very complicated thing. And I've always been an outsider wherever I've been, and I used to hate that, and now I love it because it gives me a, it gives me a, a, a vantage point. It gives me um, an, an ability to see different points of view, and it also makes me want to create um, family wherever I go. And so that I think uh, if, uh, uh, if you look at my work with Young Playwrights Theater, the Latinx Theater Commons, it was all this sense of loneliness <laughs> and, uh, and wanting to connect with other people. And so all of my plays are always about connection because I know how it feels to always be the person who's different in any room, no matter in which country I've been. In other ways, I've also known it's how to be the person who has something that can relate everybody because I'm like oh I'm Uruguayan oh I'm Lebanese oh I'm you know I'm <laughs> Mexicana so you know so it's been that for me thank you <laughs> my, my grandfather's uh, Lebanese also Mira, somos parientes de muchos <laughs> <laughs> right, right. no wonder we're always at the fabric store <laughs> I, I, I buy fabrics for no reason I I want to trade with you <laughs> Get on the spice trail. <laughs> Great question, Dr. Lopez. And um, so home and, and trauma, right? We, I think we're all owing and owning up to, to that. And, you know, seeing uh, Mo Mother Road and then Cambodian Rock Band back to back yesterday was a, a real powerful gut punch because we're, we're all searching for where is our little 
do you live in Cambodia? Do you live in the San Joaquin Valley? You know, we're, and, and, and even uh, uh, between two knees, there's literal homes, you know. And the work of Culture Clash, when we looked at Chavez Ravine, the idea of the removal of homes, um, in this case, to make room for Dodger Stadium 10 years later. Um, and, and, the, and that, and being on the, um, in cartel country uh, with Sean San Jose and Campo Santo, exploring uh, the idea of safe houses and, and homes that are protected and safe that migrants, uh, uh, undocumented transgender, a kid can, can live for a couple of months in safety. That's usually with uh, the Lutherans from Tucson or the Jesuits or the Sisters of Mercy. And we were ushered um, to, to several homes um, in not armored cars, but we had to have the tacit approval of the cartels of that particular area um, to sit in a home and talk with somebody whose idea of home is constantly shifting and dangerous. Um, so this idea of, of home um, is a powerful one. I remember um, at age nine, my son Mountain is nine. He was born here in Ashland uh, during equity dinner at... Uh, <laughs> 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 Nurse Miller's like, you need to be back for your run through, don't you? I go, how do I do that? <laughs> and I made it back to the rehearsal hall for our first run through. And Joe Bonnie said, get back to your wife. <laughs> and I said, well, just after the first 15 minutes, I've got to see. <laughs> Stephen Sapp was just telling me he couldn't leave. You just can't leave productions here. You know, even if you have an understudy, you just, you got to see it through. That's part of the gig, right? Boots on and, and the work ethic here, right? Um, but when I was nine, um, I had an unusual sense um, that my dad was involved in, in the at the height of the Chicano movement and involved in very, very, very dangerous, uh, serious things. My mother had this 22 uh, handgun that when my dad would, when the phone would ring at a certain time, she'd pick up the phone and either she'd be clutching the gun or it was nearby and we were six little Montoya kids gathered around. There wasn't a sense like, we knew not to touch the weapon, but that, that was that moment. The Brown Berets and Black Berets were going down. You know, there was carloads coming from Oakland. It was this thing was gonna happen, or August uh, 29th, 1970, um, the Chicano Moratorium in East LA where Ruben Salazar, our, our, our most cherished LA Times uh, columnist, um, had, had been shot to death uh, in, in a bar. My dad called my mom from that bar in that hour. And my dad was trying to jot down a poem. It was like a war correspondence, people ducking in for a beer, and there were bombs, and uh, about four or five people died that day. So if Neil Young sang about four dead in Ohio, we had, we had our dead also, you know? And my dad, as a poet, was out there chronicling all that. And I remember worrying about him greatly. Like, he's leaving in the Volkswagen bus. He, he may not come back, I had the sense. And my other brothers and sisters, I, I think no less feeling, but they were always outside. I was in my room building Tinker Toys and Lincoln Logs. I was, I was starting my playwriting journey, but I was always alone in my room, and I'd watch my dad leave, you know? And uh, the other night, I was going to take the midnight uh, train out of uh, Union Station, L.A., to get to a film festival in San Francisco. Um, there's a train you can take in the night. And, be, and I had to write, and I love writing on the train. And uh, my son comes in my little man cave, my little writing nook area, right? And he's nine. And he has the same sense. He's like, Dad, don't, don't go. Let's watch a movie tonight. And I just told my wife, I, I'm not going anywhere. You know, I'll have to fly tomorrow, but... He just wanted to get in that little couch and have that safety and watch that movie. And uh, I, he kind of has the same sense that sometimes we go away for a long time and he's always trying to, to make his home and make his safety. Mm -hmm. I like that, thank you. Um, wow. Uh, my father and my mother came from Puerto Rico at very young ages. Um, from the mountainous uh, town of Lares in Puerto Rico. He was, mm, he was probably around 13 years old when he first came to the States. He went to Florida to pick oranges as a migrant worker. Um, and then he went to Buffalo, New York, where he also picked asparagus and all kinds of things. Um, then he made his way down to New York City, where some of his other siblings were kind of setting up shop. And at around that same time, my mother uh, a 
arrives in New York and they meet there. From the same town, not knowing each other, but meeting on the same block at the pool on the corner of Houston. Uh, if you ever go to Houston Street Pit Pool, that's where my parents meet. Yeah. Wow. Um, wow. <laughs> and uh, they didn't know each other. I, c I can't believe I'm telling this story. But anyway, <laughs> they didn't know each other, but they, there was something familiar about them, and they fell in love. And uh, m life was talking about trauma. Life was very difficult at that time um, for a lot of for, uh, the world, let alone small Latino communities throughout the country, let alone Puerto Ricans coming to the Lower East Side of Manhattan with no English language, with no money, with no knowledge of what was waiting for them. Um, so they fall in love and because of the situation, they, they got together. And my father one day brings his brother over and says, hey, I wanna introduce you to my girlfriend. And it was my mother's brother. You know, and that was, it was about, they, there were all these connections, and of course it was complicated when my uncle found out, what? This is my sister, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there's a little West Side Story thing going on in there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so it was complicated, but the idea that the threads, it was inevitable, right? The connections that even from that small town, they were gonna come here and this is where they were gonna meet and his best friend just so happened to be my mother's brother and like just life, right? And uh, one of the things that my father always, he, to this day, like he went back to Puerto Rico because that's every Puerto Rican's dream, right? Especially yeah. if you come from the island, it's like I'm going home. <laughs> so home has always been Puerto Rico. And even for us who, I was born and raised on the Lower East Side, so I'm a New Yorkan, but my, my father was like, you're Puerto Rican, my first language was Spanish. Mm -hmm. Um, so he raised us with this kind of yearning for home, right? And home was always the island, you know? And that love and respect for everything we are, all the people that came before us, even if I wasn't born there, that's where I'm from. And he kept telling me that over and over again. He's like, no matter, we're Puerto Rican, we're Puerto Rican, we're Puerto Rican. Here's my Puerto Rican flag. I was gonna leave it in the back, but I was like, nah, I'm gonna park my Puerto Rican flag right here, anyway. <laughs> so the idea of home has always been complicated for me in particular because home is Puerto Rico, first and foremost, right? Even though I was not born there. And, it does, and even when I go to Puerto Rico, I'm part of the diaspora, the diaspora. I'm not really Puerto Rican, I'm New Yorkan. It's like this complicated conversation. Then I'm a New Yorkan, but then I'm a New Yorker, which is something completely different. Then I go from the Lower East Side to the Bronx, and now I'm a Bronxite. Um, I don't even know if that's a word, but I'm saying it, <laughs> right? <laughs> and there I met, I think, the person that became my home, who was Steven Sapp, and mm -hmm. I don't want to get soggy about it. Um, <laughs> but that's where I think that I understood what my mom and my dad were, or how they were maneuvering in this world, okay? It was about maneuvering from Florida to Buffalo to New York to wherever, to back to Puerto Rico. They've always maneuvered together. You know, and it was like, and understanding how their threads connect. And I think that that's something that we've done. And we've managed to maneuver our way all the way to Ashland, Oregon, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then calling Ashland home and becoming a home owner for the first time in Ashland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what does that mean? <laughs> okay, and loving this place as well. But then also understanding that because my life has always been about moving peoples, also expecting that there will be another time that I will have to move. Just because that's always been my reality mm -hmm. or the reality of so many people in my life. Mm -hmm. So kind of like, I wonder how long I'll be at this home and I wonder where my next home will be. Mm -hmm. And creating an ensemble that is a nomadic ensemble that bounces from home to home in every re theater, regional community theater, every just always bouncing from home to home. So home for me is wherever I stand, if that makes any sense. Yep. And the people that I write for are the voices that I hear on the journey. Ooh, wow, that's well said. <laughs> Tough act to follow. <laughs> but it also, it's, it's really interesting how um, we're aged by the things that we remember uh, 
And so no one looked confused when uh, Richard brought up Lincoln Logs. Like, <laughs> we all know immediately what those are. In fact, it was like, oh yeah, I had those. Uh, for me, um, you know, actually, you know, playwrights are like actors. We all lead an itinerant life. We go where the work is, where the work calls us. Um, so I have found that for me, home is, is my house. It's actually where I live. That's where the writing happens. And so it's important for me to have a real strong base there uh, of operations where I can do everything, where I can nest, where I can think, where I can read, where I can catch up with the world, where I can be quiet with my ghosts and work in my studio. And that brings me to the studio, that I have to have a writing room that is separate from the house, that is, uh, that is its own space. I was very fortunate to have that in San Francisco for 25 years. And when we moved to Ashland, it was one of the first things my wife said we have to have in on this property. We have to get your studio built. So we broke ground almost within a month of our moving there. And it's a special place for me um, because that's where the writing happens. I, ironically, I still go to cafes to write. Uh, <laughs> it, that was always part of the deal, is that, is that we need the, the hubbub of voices, like, like being around bees uh, to, to focus our, 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 our vision. Um, but that's where it happens. And, uh, and home is also important because we love to entertain, we love to have artists come and writers come and hang out and exchange ideas to rap about anything under the sun or moon. And uh, because that's also something that is very important to, to us. It, 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 our home is defined by the voices that, that are in it. And, um, and so it's important for us to have artists in our, in our home. Um, I've been very fortunate in that I've had numerous artistic homes um, since I really became a serious playwright, when I became serious about the craft. I, I've, I, I, and, and I can't say that there's ever been one. Mm. Um, and, and any theater that has produced three or more of my works uh, are, are consider me almost company members. Uh, I've had a long 30-year career history with South Coast Repertory and the, and the people that have been there, uh, a long relationship with Intersection for the Arts and uh, Campo Santo, and, and which is in San Francisco. But I also had a home at the Magic Theater um, and, and at the, the now defunct, but very dear to my heart, Thick Description. Uh, all that, while that's going on, I was still developing a relationship with this company. So it was very important to me. Uh, it, all, all these theaters are very important to me. And even the theaters that produce my play just once, just the one time, I do my best to kind of embed myself in, in, in their communities, mm -hmm. to know who the box office manager is, mm -hmm. to know who's working in marketing and research to, uh, and, and publicity to know the people who are the pit crew, the ones that are working backstage, to become on a first name basis with the literary staff, with the uh, associate directors in the company, to get to know them because they're gonna be family for at least four to five weeks. <laughs> and so I, I do my best to try to nest, um, to embed myself in, in, in those communities. Uh, and, and therefore it's a little heartbreaking when I have to leave. I just opened a play on Friday and I left this company uh, to its own devices mm. on Saturday morning and it was, I, I'm still kind of broken hearted about that because I wanna be there with them. I, I, I wanna hang out with them. I wanna share drinks with everybody. I wanna, I still wanna give them notes. <laughs> 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 that, <laughs> and that's why they make us leave. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So anyway, that's to me, you know, that's there's home is a fluctuating thing, right? Absolutely, right? yes. Um, I'm a proud member of the Black Sheep family, and um, <laughs> I was uh, my born and raised in a, into a farm worker family in Delano, California, and uh, so the idea of being a migrant artist has always been part of I think my journey uh, of growing up as a citizen, and then just incorporating it into my art. 
So uh, I guess the most interesting thing about this idea of home for me was I had a 10 year stretch. I was involved in the performance art world and poetry world before I came to theater. And uh, I had a 10 year stretch where I went to live in a different city in America for up to a year at a time. And so Hartford, I was in Hartford for a year and um, Houston, Texas, and usually in, in towns that were experiencing some sort of difficulty. So I usually do this thing I call an ofrenda, an offering. So I'll be working on a play, but I'll also do some so social service project. So I'll work a lot with people, uh, young kids mostly, in uh, uh, criminal detention centers, things like that. And so um, in each one of these cities, you know, you don't have a car. You kind of just start to feel your way around. A year into it, you start to meet everyone, and you start to hang out in the spots where you hang out. And so I'm very much a, a public writer, I think. So this idea of having the space sounds really romantic to me. Um, <laughs> but I really know my coffee shops in LA, because um, <laughs> that's what I do. You know, So I, I live in a very, uh, I like to keep things very simple, because I like to go. So I have like zero balance on all my credit cards. And uh, I have, don't have a TV, I don't have a stereo. I just kind of keep it very, very simple. And then I go, right? So that's just sort of my thing. And I think this um, romantic idea I had when I first came to the theater was that you had a home somewhere. You would go to a theater and they would, that would be your theater. And it's really not the reality. So the Magic Theater is a home, the Goodman Theater, Victory Gardens Theater. There are so many wonderful theaters who have had productions that I think of homes that are the places that you land in. But they really are like um, my dormitories in a way, right? Yeah. And, uh, and really the idea of home is I think an idea in my head and I think it really comes from um, being uh, in a farm worker family, that we always moved, that we always were on the trail, right? And um, so when I was young, this really precocious, obnoxious teenager, I read a book by a woman named Dorothy Day called The Long Loneliness. And uh, it was about this rich, do you guys know the book? This rich, wealthy socialite, true story, who gave up all her, all her money and uh, started the Catholic worker uh, soup kitchens. Yeah, yeah. and so um, I was so uh, romanticized by it that I convinced my parents at 12 to let me go live with the, at the Catholic worker soup kitchen. And my parents let me go, <laughs> which, which is a whole other trauma that I, I need to be exploring. But um, so I went to live at the soup kitchen for a year. And that really then changed me completely because it was um, the space was internal. So the space stopped being external. It started being a space inside. And I think that really changed the way I write. So it changed the way I started to do work. It changed the way I started to live in the world. And, uh, and then I could go to prisons and I could go to um, work with uh, you know, young incarcerated individuals and really have a sense that we could make home wherever we were at. And um, so yeah, I, I like this idea of the studio, but it feels <laughs> scary. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see it tonight. <laughs> you know, no one. Uh, sorry, Tim, no one. No one sings the word home, uh, like Paul Simon, uh, Simon and Garfunkel. Home, na 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 na. Home. Yeah. Uh, thank you. This is, is so such powerful stories. Uh, what's your process of making home through your work, for yourself, but also for others? Because you all have founded things, and you have such a profound sense of what home means for you but i'm also wondering you know how do you make it for yourself because you're finding home in different spaces but also how are you making it for others culture clash will turn 35 this may and we started in 1984. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't buy you a cup of coffee in la but uh, Around the 20 year mark, we realized that we had kept the group together longer than any of our parents' marriages had lasted. <laughs> <laughs> like, we are keeping this dysfunction together. <laughs> and we've learned to work in a way that Herbert has a residency in San Diego, Salinas pops around, but at least once, twice, three times a year, we do get together in an honest uh, way and still fortunate enough to have people like Lisa Peterson in our life, Chris Acebo designing and now directing. Um, 
these things are very important that we get back to Berkeley Rep, which has been a kind of a home in the, in the spring. And the, because I think the Bay Area needs a good dose of culture clash right now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. And, yeah. Hell yeah. and I'm happy to say the work has sharpened. And the, the work has sharpened, and, and our sights are on um, social justice warriors uh, working to get children out of cages, judges, uh, lawyers, brave, brave people working you know, um, at Ground Zero. We, we had that one New York minute where we were kind of New York writers for, for one second. And what it was was we were uh, retuning a Frank Lesser musical, right, Guys and Dolls. And Frank had written this wacky musical based on a Bud Schulberg uh, short story that appeared in Playboy in 68 about this, a miracle, a fake miracle, and a little Mexican village. So it was very much uh, the Frank Lesser version of a village. And we were, we were legitimately uh, with Joe Lesser, his, his widow, she passed away last year, a marvelous pistol of a woman from Houston, Texas. Little bitty thing that was just a, a firebrand of a lady. She, she cracked the whip on us because uh, we'd be writing in Frank's office every day. And, and there's pictures of Frank on the wall and he's writing with cufflinks, uh, a <laughs> bourbon, <laughs> a tie and a sombrero. He wrote this play wearing a sombrero <laughs> every day. <laughs> so we tried to emulate this, you know, we're, why are we going to Pink's and buying $100 shirts? It's like, man, when in Rome, try to, you know. And uh, it was a gas and it was, you know, there we were on 44th Street learning that avenues are long and streets are short and getting to the rehearsal room, pages and Joe Lesser scolding us, you know, knock that crap off, you know, we were trying to, Right. Um, then I went out to Bud Schulberg's house on Long Island to his home. He was a wonderful guy, blacklisted and named names and was caught up. We brought him back to L.A. to honor him with the uh, Watts Writers Project. No one had honored poor Bud was out there, out to pasture. But I went to write with him out there. And, and uh, he said, I'll meet you in the studio in the morning. And it was already after midnight. We were watching the Holyfield uh, boxing match. London Times was calling him. Spike Lee was calling him. I mean, this guy's phone was off the hook. And Bud, and uh, I said, well, what time, what time do you want to start tomorrow, Bud? And I'm thinking 10, 11 a.m. And he's like, be at the table at 7 a.m. And it's an ungodly hour for a writer. <laughs> and no coffee in the house. They had to go buy me coffee because you can't start at 7 a.m. But I really appreciated his, his blue-collar work ethic of, of Bud Schulberg. One day at the lesser office, uh, the air conditioning went down, and Joe said, we're gonna go over to Julie Stein's office. We're gonna work in Julie Stein's office. We're like three Chicanos from LA. We're like, we can't wait to meet her, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but through it all, trying to keep this family together, family <coughs> equals home, trying to keep the Clash guys together, letting people off the plantation to go. <laughs> Letting them off the farm, you know, to get energized and bring, and bring new ideas back. I have a one-year-old in the house now, so my man cave is the baby cave. And I thought that that's where I was going to be doing all this romantic writing. <laughs> and uh, it's topsy-turvy time and the nine-year-old. So just making space for them and that I can hold a baby and have the laptop open and take a load off mom. Um, uh, the mother load <laughs> off mom. And, and my son's watching SpongeBob. And... So that sort of chaos I like, and I think the reason we go out to cafes, uh, even if you have a beautiful studio set up, or writing in New York, you get to go out and brush up against humanity and bring that back. Because if not, for me, the trap of writing too much at home is like I'm convalescing, and I don't feel like I'm a part of the real world. I didn't mm -hmm. put my shoes on, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm still writing in my underwear. No, you gotta <coughs> get dressed, put the boots on, get out in the world, and then, and then at, at, at night I find the house is quiet and I can, I, can get, I can get to the home, I can get to the laptop, I can get to the home page and get a few good hours in. That's beautiful. Uh, um, I think that, uh, well, I, we're called on, off, we're often called on to be ambassadors for uh, the theater to the community. Uh, to the Latino community, uh, to the to to the to the diverse communities that are in that city, um, and I know 
that that's often how we're not just there to do plays, to have our plays done, but to help bring those audiences, to open the doors for those audiences to, to come and be there. And I understand that, and I'm willing to work that, but the contract works both ways as well. That theater has to also meet me halfway and, and help me help them, because that's how, that's how home is built. Uh, and so OSF has been very good about getting school groups, large school groups, uh, to come see the shows, to reach out to the diverse communities in and around Medford who can't afford tickets, uh, who don't even know about the play, and bring them in. Uh, I'll meet with those groups anytime, whenever they want, if, when, provided I'm available, to do that. And I enjoy that. Uh, and I've called on uh, other theaters that have brought me out for workshops or productions to arrange readings in bookstores to develop relationships with bookstores so I can do a reading of my book there for them. Um, Hartford Stage did that and developed, and uh, because they're developing a, a relationship with the Mark Twain house. Uh, and that worked beautifully. Uh, also, um, they, they, for the production of, of my play there, Quijote uh, Nuevo, uh, they also arranged for um, a curator to find the Latino artists, Latinx artists of note, uh, visual artists, to come and have their paintings exhibited during the entire run of the play. So they're there. And they, they came to a special performance that was at which they were all invited to attend uh, for free. Uh, and a reception was held for them. So it was like developing those kinds of partnerships becomes important. And it's a way for me to connect. But I also have, I understand as part of that relationship, part of that act of building home, that I have to go out to Spanish language radio stations where I embarrass myself constantly with my very, very poor Spanish, uh, and TV stations and La Prensa. I, I have to do that too because it's because I am often the one who has, uh, as, as a playwright who is at the spear point of, of their initiative to try to diversify their companies and, and their audiences. And Hartford Stage is already getting ahead of that. Their artistic director is uh, Latina, Nelia Ben Susan. Their board president is Latino from Central America and speaks fluent Spanish. Uh, and it's just really impressive to see that start to happen across the country. And I'm very, and to me, that's often what home means is how the, how the, the, the theater opens up its doors and windows, not just to me but to my community. Um, well, uh, universes will be 25 years next year. Oh, yeah. We're baby clashers. Yeah. <laughs> We're baby clashers. Um, and uh, we, trying to make home together is, is a complicated thing, just like you said. And you, at first, when you come together, you want it to be the thing that, that you want to retain, the way that was when we were that young and the way we were creating that work. Um, and then you start seeing that because you're an ensemble and you're not an individual, you, there are other needs that don't match up with your needs. And you have to start to realize, oh my God, we can't all be in this house together all the time. We have to, you know, be Wu-Tang Clan, you know. <laughs> and you need to go out and you need to be able to give each other the space and the, the you know, to say, if you want to go and try to try your hand at something, go for it. If you want to quit, quit. Maybe you'll decide to come back. And uh, at one point, Steve and I, like, we had to come to grips because the company was shifting and changing so quickly and so often that we were like, what is this? And, and we said, we decided, we were like, well, as long as the two of us are kind of standing at the gate, there'll be somebody to open the gate, you know, one or two of us. And the thing is, it has to be an open gate for that company, for these company members, these people who have helped us build this, because we did not do this in a vacuum. We do not write in a vacuum. The journey we have taken to today has not been alone. Um, from our very first members to our current members, 
you know, we're, we're um, indebted as individual artists to their artistry and their needs and their ability to take space. And also our ability, now our perm giving ourselves permission to take space as well. We're now Steve is directing and we're going out. We're like, when do we create space for ourselves and then come back home and say, hey, I learned this. Or, you know, I have this new toolbox. I have this new thing to play with. Um, so we've always said it's an open gate. It's a more, mostly we say it's a revolving door. So you can kind of, you can spin around in and whenever you're ready to jump out to one side or the other, you can do that. Um, or you can exit and you can always come back or you can stay and wait, greet people on their way back in. So that's how it's always been. And we've never fired anyone from universes, never. Um, people enter and exit. And uh, we always say they were, they were here for that season. Maybe they'll come back for another season. You know, there are seasons of our lives that people come and we interact. Right now we're all in this season together. You know, that's why we're in this room together. And when will the paths cross again? You know, you never know, maybe in another state, maybe, you know, at the next play, you know, in the supermarket. <laughs> um, but that's kind of the way that we've had to hold on to and let go of universes, um, the members, the family that is universes, and bring them to different places. Sometimes a member will be right for a particular project. Sometimes they have kids and families and, you know, they have to take care of the business. So we've, we've had to be able to kind of let go and, and let it breathe, let it breathe and, and create in different ways. Because at first we were all in New York, right? So it was like, okay, we're gonna meet at this cafe, we're gonna meet at the Barnes and Nobles, and we're gonna do this, da, 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 da. So we actually, Barnes and Nobles was our home for a long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> and, or we're gonna meet in the lobby of the public theater, cause you know, that's where you get to see famous people <laughs> walk the streets, you know? Which is what OSF is, and that's why we moved here, by, by the way. <laughs> All the famous people that come here. Um, <laughs> but that's what it was in New York. It was so much easier to work that way and to really just be like, hey, I wrote a poem, I wrote a song, I did this. Let's sit in the van and let's drive around in the van and let's sing songs. And you know, So we always said that the rehearsal room was our van because we didn't have a space or place other than Pregones, who was always there for us whenever we needed it. Um, and um, we created our own space. So, but the idea that we were together was easy, and then when we start moving and people, you know, Jamal now is in San, Fran in San Francisco, and all, how do you make, how do you write together? So we made space on Google. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we actually come together to write on uh, Google Docs, and on we do Google Hang, and uh, I'm not sponsored by Google, but if Google wants to sponsor us, you know, let me know. Um, <laughs> But the idea is that you find a place where you can see each other typing, right? And that became exciting for us to see, to just sit and watch Ninja or Jamal pop on, or you know, you know, to see Asia making changes live through her document and saying, oh my God, what is she changing? And sometimes saying, that's changing the entire direction of where we're going with this play, but then seeing it come to life is exciting. So you might take Google, Docs for granted, but for an ensemble who's trying to write, and then for designers who want to see what you're working on, and for directors who want to be like, I need to see what's happening, or want to have a little side comment saying, you know, so what are you thinking of here? You know, it's really become a very important tool for us, especially now because only Steve and I are in Ashland. Everyone, we're all over, all over right now, and so. That's kind of the way that we've been writing. Of course, we call, but we do a lot of FaceTime and Google Hanging. And, but the Google Doc, to see the, the actual document alive, it's almost like being in the same room together and watching somebody's hand moving on that paper. You know? It's not as good. <laughs> but it is the thing that we have. And uh, so that's how we've been able to create space for ourselves, where we can still communicate even without talking, where we just observe somebody something spilling in, out of their head somewhere, wherever they are, into the system, the ecosystem that is this machine, and coming out to me and just watching words and delete, deletions, and you're just like, the nerve, it's exciting. So that's kind of how we do it right now, and who knows what else will happen. What's that look Steven's giving you right now? What does that mean? What are you doing? <coughs> He's like, don't tell no secrets. What's don't tell mean? no secrets. What's that mean? What's that mean? I have bad cafe luck. I'm usually... Typhoid Mary's right next to me. 
and then uh, the Silver Lake Housewives are having a wonderful writing day. <laughs> and I'm like, I guess my idea of community got formed by two very strong things. Uh, when we moved from Mexico to the United States, I was 10 years old. We filled up our car with our, my sister and me, our clothes, and my dog, and my parents. And we just drove 3,000 miles to Boston. My, my father, uh, this was a time where our country liked to have uh, immigrants come in and have uh, give them opportunities at universities, et cetera, like that. So my father got an opportunity to study at a school in Boston. And we moved there, but we left everything behind. Our parents, you know, our grandparents, our primos, our, our house, our furniture. I mean, we only had our dog. And you start realizing what, how do you form home when you've lost all of that? And when we moved to Boston, we'd never seen snow. We'd never seen squirrels. People made fun of us. I had an accent. I came to school in fifth grade, and I tried to give everyone a, a besito on the, on the cheek. And can I tell you the scandal that came out of that? Um, and, <laughs> and so the, the cultural things that happened and what people called me after school, I would go home. I could never think of what to say, so I'd go home and write dialogues to kind of be prepared for the next day. Um, but then I started feeling like, oh, why is this boy so mean to me? And I made up some story about his father, you know? So I got kind of lost in their, <laughs> in their backstory. But, um, but so writing, awesome. playwriting actually became a tool for me to how to navigate this new country. And when, you know, my family was so small, we had nobody else, we had no one else to talk to, et cetera. You, I started talking to these characters that I was inventing. Now, I think the other part of it is that my father came here, um, he, he's a, a, a doctor's in public health, and he was working on public health at, at the school, and this disease showed up that was killing young gay men. Um, in San Francisco, and nobody knew what it was. And my father was one of the first uh, public health officials that was on this. And so the US government asked my dad to move to Atlanta for the Centers for Disease Control. And our whole, my whole high school years was the, was the band plays on, like all those people from the band plays on were in our living room, and we were the AIDS house. <laughs> On, on in our neighborhood, like oh, they have condoms there and they talk about sex. But anyway, um, <laughs> yes. But um, what was interesting to me is that people always th uh, think of you know my father was not working on finding a cure. What my father was working on was changing the culture so that a cure could be found. And I think um, awesome. I think that is where. I realized I did not, I was not great at math or you know, science, I like biology, but I wasn't great at math. But that's, I became a writer through that. But my goal was not to find a cure. I don't think theater is a cure. I found that my job was to help start shifting the culture so that cures could be found. And my way of doing it was through theater. And so very early on, this idea of a community um, work, like how do you shift the, a country that won't even talk about homosexuality, that won't, won't even talk about drug use, that won't even talk about poverty. How do you start talking about this, not only in the United States, but in Latin America, um, so that there's a shift in the culture? And that's, that completely changed my whole outset of what it meant to build family and what it meant to build community, because we kind of needed it to survive. Both my little four-person family that was alone but it was actually watching how a group of scientists from all over the world could sit down and start making up a plan that would start changing people's minds and people's hearts and how that could actually save lives. Um, and so that had a profound impact on me. And so when I look around, my whole work has been about that. And people say, oh, you're you, sometimes you're too cheerful or da-da-da. It's like that I just want to, I don't have any solutions. I am not the cure, I am not the medicine. We, all of us here, are just part of the public health <laughs> of our culture, and we're trying to shift it to include more and more people because the marginalized, as you know, HIV showed us, are part of every race, every class, every family, every continent. And our stories of loneliness, or feeling detached, or wanting home, 
or wanting to bond are part of every person's story. And so what, watching this divisiveness that's happening in the country, um, I think our work is more important now um, than ever. And I mean, the work I started, like I look at Juliet Carrillo, she's home to me. I look at, you know, the different, uh, uh, Emeritha from uh, Arena, she's home to me. All of these people are home to me because I had no home for a long time. And a lot of people don't either. And it's, it's all form. Home is just the community you build. And there's a lot of different ways of doing that. Thank you. Thank you. So it's been so powerful to hear all of you talk about the themes in your work, what motivates and inspires you, what your vision and goal is. And I want to um, have us go to another level, kind of manifesto level, right? Because in a lot of ways, we're um, architects of uh, emotional building. Uh, I love how you talked about the climate for the work, like that the work can't transform unless the climate is there. Right. If you're inviting, this is something that I think OSF has really embraced and taken leadership on is how can you bring uh, artists of color, first gen voices, how do you transform that if a climate isn't built for the success, right? How do you build a house on sand? You, you can't do that. You have to have a vision for the foundation. So I want to ask uh, each of you to describe your utopian vision of artistic home. Uh, okay, so I'll start. Um, <laughs> uh, so in, in 1993, Steve and I built our utopian vision of an artistic home. And it was in the South Bronx, it's called the Point Community Development Corporation. In there we had business incubators, so different people from the community who wanted to try their hand at doing something. Some of them were cutting hair, some of them were um, selling comic books or s music or whatever it was. And we had our own theater, Live from the Edge Theater there. We had a dance studio, my El Grito dance studio. And there were no rules. The rule was that everybody could come and play and that we could create amazing spaces for young people in our community to come and be there all day, every day, if they had a ticket, if they didn't have a ticket, they could come in because it was their home as well. Um, and we took this, it was 12,000 square foot uh, old abandoned bagel factory building. We went to the landlord and we said to him, hey, um, this thing has been abandoned for five years. There's prostitution happening in the back of the building. There's drugs, there are drugs being sold all around the building. If you let us in for a year, we can bring some programming, we can clean it, we can, and if we don't pay rent by the next year, you can kick us out. But we need at least one year to give this community a little piece of breath. And he did, Max Blauner, may he rest in peace. And he gave us that moment in time free of rent because it was abandoned, there were no windows, there was nothing, it was a husk, you know? And we went in there and we opened the door. That's all we did, we, said we didn't have any money, we were unemployed actually. And we were like, all right, now let's make something. <laughs> and uh, we opened the door and there was one young man, Jason Gamio, who came in, he was probably nine, was he nine years old? About nine years old. Came from across the street like, it's open? <laughs> and we were like, yeah, for whatever that means, yes, it's open. And he would come in and he'd like help us, he'd hang out with us all day, every day, just being there. Artists would come, Sandra Maria Estevez came and did her, read her poetry in the middle of an abandoned building for people to come and hear the words of our people. Reggie Gaines, Dale Orlando Smith, Danny Hawk. They would just come, we weren't paying them. They were just coming. They knew that the building was open and they would come. And they were like, well, if you, have, if you ever get some change, you know, you could throw it my way, but you know, if not, I'm here for the people. And that's how we started like this. It was like a little Shangri-La in the South Bronx. And there were no rules, no nothing. One day, the, the J.M. Kaplan Foundation, we invite this foundation and we're like, hey, we want you to give us some money 
so that we can make the place like more real, right? <laughs> and, and of course, like I was really young then, naivete goes a long way, I always say. <laughs> and uh, so we bring the J.M. Kaplan Foundation in and we're like showing them, look, this is where the theater, right there, right there, that's gonna be a bathroom. <laughs> and over there, this is gonna be the theater and here's the dance studio and over here we wanna do like a computer studio. And over here, we're gonna do, you know, the, we're gonna bring graffiti artists and they're gonna have tax crew. We're gonna, this is gonna be their home right here. They're gonna be there. They're gonna teach the community how to make art, you know? And the woman from the J.M. Kaplan looked around, she was like, <laughs> like, what, are you crazy? <laughs> and we were like, it's, look, it's, it can happen, it can happen. And uh, we had it like, we were just literally, we knew exactly where everything needed to be. And she says, well, the first thing you're gonna need is some heating, air conditioning units and some windows. <laughs> and that was, uh, that was a second grant because the first grant was $5,000 from Roy Lichtenstein who never even stepped foot in the building. But the idea that all you need is a husk, an idea, a bunch of hopeful people, a community that will walk into an abandoned building, a little nine-year-old child unafraid saying, I'm gonna be here every day after school. What do you want me to do? And sometimes just sits there and does whatever, brings his friends. Artists who walk in and do the goddamn thing, you know, because it wasn't, they weren't doing the, the lower level artistry that they do. They were bringing their 100% for free to those kids, to the, to, the, to the mamas and the papas from the block come. Come in, listen, Sandra Maria is speaking, you know? So it was that, that was utopia. And we were there till 2000. And the reason, we were, for eight years it was a utopia. Like there was, I, we couldn't even, we were managing it together. It was run by four people. Not an executive director, an artistic director, a managing, all that shit. No. <laughs> okay? It was not that. It was a community run organization with four heads, a four headed beast. Okay? And then we also had a board because we were becoming a nonprofit. Right, so three years later we became a nonprofit. In five years we bought the building. A building that we couldn't even pay for one year. Okay, in five years it was ours. It belonged, it was a nonprofit, it belonged to the Bronx. And it was delivered, complete. With no traditional leadership, so to speak. That was my utopian world. Then people start telling the board, hey, you know, that's not really how things are run in the world. You know, you need an executive director, you need, a, you need these rules. And the organization shifts, you know. So for me, it's when we take away the rules that we are so used to living under, or this is how it should be done, this is the way it should be, you know, why are you an ensemble? You can be an individual playwright. Yes, I can. I have so much fun with these guys. They have so much fun with me, I hope. And we love to share this kind of space. So for me, that was utopia. A utopia is a place where we can make art and music right outside in the street. And nobody needs to pay for a ticket. There was a young woman outside today asked if I don't have a ticket, can I get in? And I said, yes, I'm gonna go outside. I'm gonna go inside and make sure that that's cool. Thank you, Emerica. And absolutely it is cool because that's the kind of world that I want to live in. I do not want to live in a world where somebody is outside when their family is inside. And that's, that's my utopia. When Octavio said he goes around to all the departments and uh, we, <laughs> I'm usually in HR for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> really getting to know those folks well. <laughs> and absolutely the rank and file and the work ethic. You know, I, I was mentioned yesterday that, um, actually before I say that, what an interesting moment that Mr. Acebo and Mr. Alfaro are in this shifting home moment, you know? So I'm really, I'm not worried about them. I'm just thinking about them. I'm excited about where that, I know the home will be in all the different theaters that they're working in, but you know, where, 
uh, this weekend has been home for us, I think it's safe to say. And then tonight, uh, VIP only, you have to have a ticket. No. <laughs> but we'll be at Octavio's <laughs> spread tonight. Yeah. Get, get to meet the billy goats. And, the, and, the chickens. and you share a cow with Peter Bratt, you told me yesterday. Well, half of it's in my meat locker now. Oh, oh no. <laughs> you are Mexican. <laughs> Tacos yeah. for everybody. Sorry, the steaks are really good. <laughs> uh, uh, Tony Ciccone left Berkeley Rep and had his, his send-off dinner. It was really remarkable. And uh, there in Knob Hill, a lot of fun and crazy. And, but to hear Tony say, you know, I'm energized. There's not a problem. I just, someone else needs to come and take this. But... And he kind of walked us through the decades of what they tried so hard to build at Berkeley Rep. And it was about creating a home and space for artists where profit margin was not, whether a play made money or not, sure, we all want butts and seats. We need that. Um, we depend on that. We've been sitting in the dark together for decades. <laughs> we don't make fun of subscribers anymore. Um, <laughs> we commune and uh, we have built our own town hall with you, right? Uh, but to hear Tacconi lay out, you know, followed by Eustace, followed by Kushner, I'm not name dropping, I just mentioned that each of them, it's, it's, it's uh, social justice and, and it borrows from, uh, dare I say, the, the bad word right now, but um, a socialist uh, work ethic almost, that, that we could all come together and, and share in something. The theater could be affordable. The profit margin was removed out of it. You need a table, you need a home. You know, both my parents were uh, dedicated educators, and so that what that meant really was we rented homes our entire life. So we were renters. Um, I wanted to change that specifically for my son and daughter. That that your home, you know, will will give you that Tom Joe deed at the end of our thing. <laughs> well. We'll pass that on to you, Miho, and all the artwork in the home, and all the artwork that you love, and hopefully you're appreciating and placing value on the artwork in the house, and that the artist made it, you know, and you can't throw stuff at it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Utopia is a place where we can work, not without deadlines and not without being in the real world with everyone else, but... Um, um, it's hopefully a place that can be inclusive of, of family and different versions of family. And that, um, listen, the clock is always ticking and um, we need to feed our families. And I'm, I'm really about placing value on, on each of us and, and giving artists value and writers. and Because we really hover around the poverty line so much of our life. Uh, medical insurance, um, all these things that are very important. Uh, to us, um, so the engine and the motor that is our home and getting kids to school and to daycare and feeding kids and, and I'm looking for that space where all that is, is happening and uh, daddy's writing time is, is respected. I'm not gonna turn into Dalton Trumbo, but <laughs> who knocked on the bathroom door? <laughs> but, but you almost have to fight for that space, you know. My wife can't call me at any hour in the day like with a honey-do list. Like, because just because I'm home doesn't mean I'm working around the house, you know. <laughs> These are my hours, you know. And, and she, she's, she's cool with that. She works in the art world and, and, and understands. But every now and then, it's just like, this is on my mind, blah, 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 blah. And, and so the utopian world allows us to come and go and have family and, and be a, a joyous space, you know. Uh, but I was a bachelor forever and uh, quite well known in Southern California. <laughs> Well, it's like working with all the theaters. We have lovers everywhere. <laughs> Getty Villa, Pasadena Playhouse, South Coast Rip, Mark Taper Forum. I am fucking them all. <laughs> sorry, it's Sunday. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Dress like a rabbi even today. <laughs> Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. And, and, and so... Uh, 
creating creating home is going to allow for for all of that and, and be a, a well in my bachelor years my, my my lofts and apartments were very dark you know and I thought well I've got to be like I got to be Raymond Chandler I got to be James Elroy I got to work in the dark I got to work in a dark space you know and and now it's it's piñatas literally and Coco toys and you know everything's everywhere everything is everything and I've got to find I've got to find a way to work you know within it thank you thank you Karen. What's your vision oh, of my utopia? utopia? So my, my theater career did not start in the theater, but it started in the schools. I, I, I started an organization called Young Playwrights Theater because of my connection to writing and my own journey. So I started this little theater company where we went into schools to teach playwriting um, at the public schools in DC as a way of kids of connecting to their voices, et cetera. And, and it, it was a way of getting work to all my actor friends to come in and read it to them. And the transformation we saw um, in the children about how arts, connecting to the art, how that made them improve in their, in their um, studies, et cetera, uh, made a deep impact to me. So my utopia actually has very little to do with the theater and it has everything to do with the schools. Um, it has to do, I, I, want, I have three kids, 13, 15, 17. I want them to go to a school that makes them find their voice in the world. I want them to go to a school where they don't fear being shot. Um, I want them to go to a school where their teachers can afford to live in the same neighborhood and go to that. Um, and I, it, it just, I guess, and I, it, if, if we have that with our schools, then everything from there, I think, comes out of that. So, I mean, yes, I would love to, you know, work in my plays and theater and all of that. But, but because of where my work started in the community at there, that's where I think the arts makes a huge difference. And I think those become the future audience. I mean, I just think it's something that kind of pays itself forward. But I, I, I we have kids in cages right now. Like, I mean, I think the idea that we um, always need to go back and remember who the next generation is and what are we doing to help them find their voice and what are we doing to protect them is something that um, keeps me up at night. And so I, for me, it's all about public schools and valuing our teachers and valuing our students and, um, and making them feel safe. And so uh, if, the, if our art can help in any way in that sense, and if our advocacy can help in that, I think all of that, it will it'll bleed everywhere else. But it's a very big utopia. That's my utopia. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Um, but, it's, but it's very hard for me, therefore, to really think of utopias now uh, in this climate, where somebody can just load up an AR-15 and take it to El Paso, my hometown, and 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 remind people who's boss. Yeah. To stem the tide of immigration in a way that is, in, is, is really uh, a, a large gaping wound in my community at, back home right now. And uh, it's just really hard to conceive of that until we can be looked, on, looked upon as, as true Americans in this country, until we're not looked upon as aliens in our own land, until we can dispel that amnesia somehow that, that we are immigrants when we were here first, <laughs> it's, it's, just, it, it's just really hard for me to conceive of any kind of utopias. Uh, we live in a dystopia right now. It really feels like a dystopia. This keep America great thing is just, uh, it's madness. It feels, it's, it's doublespeak, it's Orwellian. Um, so it's really difficult for me to think about um, utopias right now and, and ideal homes. An ideal home is one where I'm not afraid and where I'm not inspiring fear in other people. So. Um, well, maybe going off of that riff, I would say that... Uh, Utopia starts to feel like a very personal, private place. Um, when I first started, um, you know, I'm going to age myself, but in the 80s, I started a lot of nonprofits, and uh, I was really involved in social political work in L.A., and that's really what brought me to art. Art, for me, has always been the means to create social change. So I really wanted to 
create art and be the artist that I was because I think I was trying to use it to change the world, right? So um, I've always been sort of institutionalized in that way. I ten, spent 10 years at the Mark Taper Forum. I'm just finishing up 10 years here. So, you know, uh, I think I've always been inside of an institution. But um, my training, uh, uh, the little training that I've had as an artist has always been about um, failure, that out of failure, great, great things happen. And so I studied, like many of us here with Irene Fornes, who uh, really encouraged me to you know, walk through fire, jump off the cliff. And, um, <laughs> and really, what I think I'm doing in the second part of my life, and I, I know I've been doing it at least for the last 15 years, is to subvert the systems that I'm in. So I teach at a, a $7 billion university, uh, USC, where we're plagued with scandal. And, um, and, uh, and so it's a wonderful place to be on one level because you can always subvert a system, right? And so uh, everything I teach is contrary to what I'm told to teach in a way, right? I, so we're really jumping off the cliff all the time. I spent the last year uh, working with young writers in East LA and, um, and it was really kind of a radical act. We are going to write plays that are going to fail. We are going to embrace failure as the ultimate form of experimentation. We are going to create a very different kind of play. We are going to go deep, deep inside of ourselves and create a kind of artwork we haven't seen in the world. So we're not gonna buy into the systems. But the systems are the way that we survive, right? So I need health insurance. And, and the university really provides that. And in exchange for that, I bring the best of myself into the subversion world, right? And, uh, and we jump off cliffs all the time. So I really think that for me, this big gigantic idea of a utopia is a place where all I do is experiment all the time. If I have great plays, whatever good plays I've had, whatever plays have gotten produced have been my biggest failures, right? So I know I'm onto something. I know I'm onto an idea here. In it, I must fail in order to get to something interesting, right? And I think it's that I, I'm not writing out there, but I'm writing in here. And I'm never alone, because I'm always in community. So I'm always writing through community, and I'm always creating an in-community, and we fail together. So that is very utopian for me, right? this idea that we're all going to jump off the cliff, the creative cliff together, and we're going to make something completely new and different. We're going to embrace language differently. We're going to uh, play against form. We're going to do all of that. And somehow, um, I feel that even in the darkest of moments, and I have these very dark moments, because I'm very um, sensitive to what's going on in the world, I dig deeper, deeper, deeper inside myself to, uh, to fail miserably, <laughs> to move towards that little seedling of a great idea. So I am embracing the darkness, because in times of great darkness, and this was the one thing that my parents gave me as farm workers, they used to say, because we were very involved in the United Farm Workers Movement, from Delano, right? So my parents used to say, we must bring to light that which is in the dark. That was the only thing my parents really always said to me. <laughs> and they said, we must bring to light the, uh, that which is in the dark. So um, maybe my biggest disappointment to my parents was I came out as a, as a queer man, and then I said, we must bring to light that was in the dark. <laughs> and they were like, uh. <laughs> And the second worst thing I did to them was I said, I'm a poet. We must bring to life. That was the and they went, ah. <laughs> so I have failed miserably and been greatly, greatly successful. And you're in the light, brother. Way in the light. Um, uh, we have time for, I want to create a space for w at least one question, <laughs> um, uh, a burning question. Um, uh, let's jump in. We, I want to start, if Paul has the mic. Paul, you want to bring it up here? Thank you. Um, so my question, touching on what Octavio had said around uh, the idea of being in this dystopia and trying to be seen as Americans, as part of the fabric and, and the things that make the culture that is exported out to the rest of the world beyond whiteness in and of itself. Um, to me, that feels almost limiting 
because Latinidad is so much bigger than just the few representations here, Puerto Rican, Uruguay, Mexicanos, Chicanos. Um, when we talk about things like that, especially within uh, Latines, we realize that we are limiting ourselves because there's so much that is complex to bring to the stage. Like, how do we talk about anti-Black sentiment in Latino community? How do we talk about the inherent caste system developed from the Spanish Dawn systems for the Californios? How do we bring that complexity to the stage and into our day-to-day -day discussions in a place like Ashland that is white monocultured? You know, you were talking about how you need to be surrounded by community in order to be able to reflect those voices. But what do you do when those voices don't match anything that you know or say or do or experience? Because you're surrounded by white people. Um, I just stumbled upon this weekend. I didn't even know that this was happening when I decided to come back up here and see Between Two Knees and Mother Road because I didn't get a chance to see them earlier. And for me, everything that I keep coming back to is who is this art actually for at the end of the day? We're writing as you know, Chicanos and Latinos and, and we're doing all of this work and we're kind of eviscerating ourselves on stage for audiences that don't pick up the nuances, for audiences that aren't listening to the quiet little Tejano background sound when you make a stop in Texas who hear the words pinche migra but they don't actually understand like how deeply ingrained in my life those words actually are. And when I draw joy from that and when I draw excitement and I'm able to respond to that, I know that the art is speaking to me and I know that I, part of it is for me, but it's also trying to placate white sensibilities because it's a majority white audience. So who is our art actually for? Where is our sense of home when home is telling us that it's on fire and we can't go back to it? When home is telling us that there should be a wall between where our hearts are and where our roots are? When home doesn't exist for us because we are told we are not a part of it? I mean, I just, it, it's so beautiful what you're saying, and I'm, it's, uh, it's popping so many things, but there are so many thoughts, and it's so big, and so maybe if I can just simplify it a little bit for myself, just because that's a lot to take in, but I will say this, um, when I started my career, the, the Chicano community was not the community that embraced me, because I was a queer man. So I started in the black community, and then I moved into the Asian community. That's where my first six plays were done by Asian American actors. And then, then my community joined, got on boat, right? So because of that experience, the otherness that we're talking about right now, I am very, very conscious of a kind of shared humanity, that the nuances that you're talking about are experienced in a lot of different ways. Maybe that's why I keep reaching and doing mentorship work, because for me, uh, the nuances that another generation gets are not the same that I get, but I know that there's, there's a shared humanity that's going on. I know that there's something that's happening between you and I in the electricity of the room, and I have to believe that it goes beyond who I am in just one community. So I'm many communities, and rather than sort of like thin that out, how do I just tell this very specific, unique story that belongs only to me, knowing that it's going to register in so many ways. Yes, the music, that little piece of music, that little line, right? So I have, I use Nahuatl in the play, right? Uh, who's going to know Nahuatl? Well, in my research, just having come up an uh, off-Broadway play, uh, there are 500,000 Mexicans living in New York City. I didn't know that. There are 3,500 that speak our indigenous language. Even if one of those 3,500 show up to the theater, they're going to get something very different than everybody else. Mm -hmm. I have to believe and I have to trust that my job has to be bigger than me. I have to build the allyships. I have to build. <laughs> Listen, can I just be so b lovingly blunt? I have to extend myself 
to what is a majority audience here if I'm going to stay inside of this thing and change it. So I'm always, I am at a large, big, fat, large university trying to subvert it every single day. <laughs> I'd like a chance to respond to the charges. Um, <laughs> here at Sunday Morning Nuremberg. Um. Me metí como tres cafecitos antes de que llegue, so I'm ready. I, your monologue was astounding <laughs> and beautiful. And what you've been thinking about, because I've been sitting next to you at each show. <laughs> uh, and for me, the biggest gut punch for me the weekend, uh, because I look at the work as, as, as templates and, and what Cambodian rock band is doing, I was completely gut punched with how quiet it is, how nuanced it is, how still it is, how not a musical, it's, it's not, you know, it's like, it's not that jukebox thing, you know, and how they're making their points and it only makes me, and I had to send you, my, my, I was devastated after the Cambodian rock band. And, and I think Mother Road had a lot to do with it too, going into the torture chambers of, of that camp, right? And we're all in there. It reminded me of a lot of the way that August Wilson wrote, you know? You, you had to have that respectful distance from the work. I, inside that distance, we can do our work. Get, I think there's questions, you know, uh, in all of our work all the time. Like, how, we know that at the taper, it's, it's going to be 90% Anglo and wealthy and cranky uh, sometimes <laughs> and liberal. But in there, we got we to gotta get our, our jabs and our, and, our, and our punches in. Um, working on a musical, it's going to be very tricky because everyone wants a huge hit, right? I don't know if it's going to be a huge hit. 1959 is a tricky year, but it's a very modern year. And part of what I'm saying, we Chicanos, Chicanos, we were a part of it. We were, we were there. My dad just got off a minesweeper from the Navy. We were there. We, we impacted rock and roll. Not just one British invasion, two British invasions. Chicano, rockers from Coima, from San Fernando. From, you know, we were there. And so that's the flag I'm going to try to plant in there and make my point uh, thusly and hopefully not lose myself in it to, you know, every, you know, the next Hamilton or, you know, because because a lot of this work can be very crowd pleasing. And um, Cambodian rock band, everything I saw this weekend was crowd pleasing, but with a lot of thorns in it. You know, like <laughs> my chair is so comfortable with all these thorns. Um, Mother Road actually has two protagonists. It has Martin, who I'm sure you understood, related to, and understood his journey. And then there is also William. And I knew when I was writing that, that I was writing it largely for an audience that would be, see it here. And I know the audience here. You have, that's what, I'm, that's what home is about. Learn, who are you writing the plays for? That's the question you ask. So I knew the audience coming in. And, and what I'm showing them is a two-pronged thing. What I'm showing everyone there is a two-pronged thing. It's that Martin is going to what he deserves, what he's earned through his life, through his struggle, uh, as a direct descendant, not only of his mother's legacy, but also Tom Jones. But I'm also showing how that, to the other audience, uh, a lot of them older white men, how they have to pass the baton. And history now belongs to the young and the brown. And, and to do it gracefully, and to do it without animus, to give their chair at the feast to somebody who deserves it for, to, for the next generation. And I think every, that's something that I think and I hope uh, all audiences are recognizing, that it's done without, that he starts at one place really wondering like, what, I'm giving my land to a Mexican? What am I doing? To at the end, recognizing that he has to, that this is the right choice that he has to make. If America is going to go to its next full chapter. And that's, uh, <laughs> and, and so I can't just skew it for the Latino audience. Um, because in almost every theater I've ever worked in, I, I have a responsibility to write to the audience that is going to be there. 
and inviting other people to come and see it too. But it's got, I got to respond and respect the audience that is there. Uh, especially, and you know, I used to, I used to also kind of, in my, in my younger years, I, especially when I lived in San Francisco, I used to disparage the, those old, very old ladies who used to come and always be there at the shows, all like this. But they... Hello. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but they, they are the repository of the world theater. They have seen, uh, when I was going to them at ACT, they saw Samuel Beckett's first production of Waiting for Godot. <laughs> They saw August Wilson's work. They saw Culture Clash. They came to those shows. And, uh, and, and so you know you have to respect that audience. You can't, you can't not talk to that audience. You have to in invite them around the table so that they can have their teaching moment as well. Uh, because I'm writing for a larger audience than just my culture. Now, when Mother Road is done in El Paso, when it's done in San Antonio, oh my God, the place is going to blow off the roof. Uh, right now, Quixote Nuevo is running at Hartford Stage. It has blown off the roof. It's really crazy. And 90% of the people there have no clue what is being sung in Spanish and being spoken in Spanish. They don't have, but neither, do the, neither does the Latino community that's there. <laughs> They, have, they don't understand what I'm saying because it's all Chicano speak, you know? And not only that, it's a kind of a mixtape of Chicano and English and Spanish and uh, Cervantes and Shakespeare and me. It's all just this crazy mixtape. And yet, somehow, they get it. They get it because, as my character, my Quixote says, it's not command of the language that matters, it's command of the heart. And, uh, and so they're, that's the audience. The audience that wants to see theater, those are the ones I'm ultimately writing for. We saw a woman at Syracuse State play Queen, like Kurosawa. I'm sorry? You can't hear me, I'm projecting. <laughs> a woman walking in a snow blizzard that was coming sideways to buy a ticket to our evening show. And we were in the lobby eating, like just watching her go, Puri, ride, Puri, ride. <laughs> and literally the, the Syracuse snow coming this way, right? And w Rick, Herb, and I just look at each other, do we know one Chicano that would do that? <laughs> so, <laughs> can, I, can I just answer, just say one quick thing? It'll be really fast. Along, uh, I, I believe that we use the word privilege a lot, right? And we almost gift it to people nowadays. You know, we, we tell our white audiences, you guys are privileged. You're privileged, you're privileged, you're privileged, you're privileged. And people begin to be believe that. And if you hand privilege over so quickly, you lose privilege. Um, and you are no longer privileged if you're constantly giving the privilege away. Right? So I've decided in my life that I'm going to walk into rooms as if it's my room. And you are my guest. Okay? I'm going to walk onto this stage with my power, my privilege. You know? I'm not going to be... I, I don't want to live in a world where I live in the drudge and the... What do we call it? The, the, the emotional pain and the, everything that we've been, everything that our ancestors have struggled with. I'm going to bring that because that gives me privilege. All of those journeys, all of the things that we go through, all the doors we've had to bust open. Because culture class, everybody here has busted doors open. People are still busting doors open for us. We're, but we're trying. Like, so that gives us a sense of power. And when I, when I feel we bring our plays to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, that is a place of privilege because I am bringing you guys are worthy of observing <laughs> this amazing work, okay? So I just want to reverse it, and in opposed to us being the servant, you know, I believe every time that our voices are heard in these spaces of power, <clears throat> it's because it's our power that's being heard in that space. 
Okay. You know, I don't care who is in the room. I don't care. We can, that's why I say if we're out in the street, you don't, can't control the passerby. You don't know who's passing by and who's going to take something with them or who's going to leave something for you. You have to be open, and you have to know your privilege. You just sat up here, stood. I wish, I wish you would have stood. But you sat, and you sat in all your privilege. And I honor that, and I respect that, and the strength and power that you brought to that question because it is a sensitive question. But you have that privilege, and I, want, and I don't want to take your power away. And this audience, the OSF audiences actually, need to start believing that they are privileged to witness what we have to bring. I'm, I'm going to make sure that we, we're running uh, over. I want to thank uh, our panelists for uh, incredible vision and voice about home and expanding home. Karen's Copper Children is coming, uh, and you'll get more of a sense of the definition of home and the work that she's making. And I want to um, thank all of you for engaging in the work. I really appreciate what was said in the final moments. And I want to thank uh, Christopher Sibo and Luis Come Alfaro. <laughs> I want to thank them. Standing ovation. I want to thank them for the LPP as a home within the home of OSF. Uh, the world we live in is very complex. We need each other. I'm always very aware that uh, how we look and who we actually are is infinitely more complex and than uh, what appears on the surface, and this is a place to dive in deep. And I just want to thank everyone for being here for the journey of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.